Hi everyone, Jeremy here, and welcome to another episode of the DGDC Nightcast, where we stay up late and listen to the sounds of the night. There was an owl out here a little while ago, we'll see if he comes back. We're going to be talking tonight about how to evolve the standard of patient care, and it's a little bit non-linear. We're going to outgrow the 80-20 rule, and what I want to do is kind of share some of my observations from my own journey as an Eastern medicine practitioner and what I've observed with our colleagues as well. And maybe you can kind of figure out where you are on this map. Let's see if you can identify yourself here. But in the beginning, we start with our education and we basically are learning like the 10,000 things, you know, all the herbs, all the points, uh, Qigong stuff, lifestyle advice, everything food therapy i mean massage techniques moxa cupping gua sha like you name it there's so many of these things and they're so fascinating and so brilliant and so beautiful and we just come in like a sponge and we just start to absorb as much as we possibly can now that that's great because now we have a ton of options a ton of tools at our disposal however the downside the trick here the catch is that the more tools we have in the toolbox the more mental energy we have to expend to try to figure out which one to reach for for any given patient. And this is where it starts to get really important and basically it's like a make or break kind of growth point as for practitioners to be able to start to develop very clear clinical thinking, especially when it comes to complex chronic conditions or anything where there's a lot of moving parts. You know, if you have a very simple, straightforward case, sometimes you can just reach in the toolbox and grab the first thing that comes to mind and whatever else, and and the person can get some relief and some results. But a lot of times when we have these complex cases, whether it's an inflammatory condition or fertility or somebody's, you know, working on like recovering after cancer or something, there's all different kinds of cases where the whole ecosystem of the body needs tending. And in my opinion, this is one of the places where we really, really shine coming in and cultivating life and nurturing life and helping the body to do what it already knows how to do, which is heal and thrive and flourish. And basically just to regenerate the ecosystem after some form of illness or some kind of problem, right? This is where we're really, really good. The trouble is, okay, the trouble comes in in a couple ways, but some of the problem comes with our framing because whether you know it or not, our training when we're students is to start looking at case studies and starting to take our toolbox, our tool set, and then look at how they can be successfully applied to certain case studies. And we have tests and quizzes and things like that. And then we go to a clinic shift and it's the same kind of thing. Like here's the patient, diagnose the patient. What are the points you would do? What are the herbs you would do? All this kind of thing, which is good. It's, it's well, and it's good. It is. However, the problem with that is that inherently we've put a frame around our thinking in terms of what are we doing today for the patient? What's the answer today? And we have to like make our decision of what we're going to do right now. And instead, when we learn to see things as more of a process, we can start to look at how are we going to project this care plan, this treatment, this relationship with this living being, this sovereign human who's coming to us for help. How are we going to project that into the future? And now we start to understand prognosis and we start to understand the different phases or stages of healing and how people may respond to certain things we do and learning how to pivot and learning how to take feedback from what happens and be able to move forward in different ways. This is where we start to navigate the complexity of actually helping somebody long term. So one of the things we have to, I'd say, be kind of fearless about is shedding some of these old, I call them training glitches. Basically it's things we pick up subconsciously when we're training, when we're in a student environment and even outside of school, we can pick them up from our peers and mentors and colleagues and everything. We pick up all kinds of glitches and assumptions, but we have to be fearless about looking at them, reevaluating them and deciding consciously if we want to maintain these beliefs, these assumptions. And one of these assumptions is that we're going to come up with the treatment plan, the point protocol, the herb prescription, whatever. And it's like, we've solved today. And then we assume that we we're also solving like the person's whole problem. And this kind of frame gets into our conversations. Instead, I like to look at a process and I tell patients up front, this is going to be a process. And it's not a vague washy thing where it's like, well, I don't know. It's complex. It's your healing journey. Right? I don't kind of default to that just 
vagueness and, and complexity. Instead, we map it out. We say, okay, here's the process. Based on what I'm seeing, we're going to start with these types of interventions, these types of therapies. Depending on your response, if all goes well, right, that'll be encouraging and good. But if we have weird side effects or something's not vibing with you, right, you're, you're getting rubbed the wrong way by the treatment, that actually gives me information and I know how to change course. Like if these herbs aggravate you instead of help you, then that's actually really valuable clinical information. This, by the way, is, we call this diagnosis by treatment, right? And then to be able to interpret that and know how to navigate. So for Eastern medicine practitioners, you know, something, I'll give you just a very simple example, but like if you go to clear heat, you use herbs that are cooling and clear heat and the person gets worse, then maybe you should shift to a warming approach, right? It's, it's that kind of thinking, right? And it's not just black and white like that, but it's that kind of thinking. So we start to map this out. This is all good. We can start to shed the kind of built-in assumption that we're just going to save the day for today, right? We, we need to start to see, instead of seeing the, the patient as a, a snapshot, a photograph, we need to start to see them as a film, right? Moving imagery. That we can look back in time, we can look forwards in time, and we can start to project basically a fourth dimension into our treatment plans. This is really, really important. It's not easy. They don't teach it in school, but here we are, right? I mean, if you want to learn these things, that's why you're on on my channel, uh, listening to this, right? So we need to start to explore these kinds of concepts. Now, one of the issues here, okay, is that first of all, we've got the pressure to like pick something and we've, we've got 10,000 things in our toolbox. So I want to get rid of that pressure, right? We need to make it clear that we have time with the patient to try a few things and to be able to navigate and move forward in different ways, which takes the pressure off having to pick the one perfect thing today out of our toolbox, right? The one perfect point or the point prescription or the one perfect herb formula or whatever it is. It's like the pressure's on and, and we give ourselves that pressure and then the patients feel it and then they expect it to be a miracle too. We, we need to let our treatments breathe a little bit. We need to let the people breathe a little bit and take the expectations down to something realistic, right? We, we need to work with the body and be able to give the body time to adjust and integrate what we're doing so that we can give it credit for the healing that it's doing over time and not get discouraged by just setting up false expectations up front. So that's one thing, right? But what I'll offer, even without kind of breaking that frame, is just looking at everything in the toolbox. And another assumption that we get is that every single one of those tools in our toolbox, every point prescription, every herb formula, all of it, it's like they all have equal weight. It's like all these tools are just spread out flat on the table and we can look at all of them and they're all valid. But in reality, when we start to look at how things are actually used, there are the 80, 20 rule basically applies, right? There are certain things, there are certain tools that you can get a lot of leverage out of. So if you start looking demographically, and this was something that really, you know, this helped me a lot in practice because I wanted to make everything very bespoke. And so I had the 10,000 things to keep track of all my different, you know, this giant granule pharmacy and like all these different acupuncture points, everything that I had so many options that it was painful to try to make decisions about what to actually do for the patient. What's the right thing to do? Yeah. So instead of looking at the right thing, like it's black and white, instead we can look at things that would be correct, right? Things that would be right. Everything that would be reasonable to do with this person and then pick some of the safest interventions that belong in that category. So one of these examples here, and I know there's this, this wave of like clinical simplicity coming through with Eastern medicine, which is great. It's fantastic. We're going to go into that tonight and we're going to go through it and beyond it because it's, it's just the start and something it, it did. It changed my life. It changed how I practice to look at things simply and using the 80, 20 rule, using the bell curve and looking at how things affect most people. I mean, I've given seminars on this stuff. Like it's, it's valid. It's a very, very helpful just like anything else, the good advice depends on what stage of development you're in. If you are in the stage of development where you're overwhelmed by the 10,000 things and still running from seminar to seminar, trying to collect more clinical shiny pearls, then in that case, right, the next step in evolution would be to start to organize the pearls that you do have and start to figure out which ones do the heavy lifting. So one of the examples that helps me with this, it's, a, it's an old business metaphor and I've actually physically done this. I have a video I did for Modern Vitality for patients to understand this concept. But if you take a jar and you go down to the beach, and I, I, you can probably find this if you look on Modern Vitality YouTube, go look for a jar with rocks in it. But if, if you go there and you take a bunch of rocks and you put the big ones in first 
and then you put the little things in around it, you can fit everything in the jar. But if you go the other way, if you just put all the little stuff in the jar, the sand and the little pebbles, by the time you go to put the big ones in, there won't be space and they stick out, right? So this is kind of a way of problem solving. And it's, again, it's like a business metaphor of figuring out what's the main thing, what are the big things, and get those handled first because little things tend to organize themselves around the big things. Just like if you put a big rock in a jar and then you start putting sand, the sand will conform to that space, right? The little things... They can be secondary or tertiary. It's usually okay. And this is where we figure out our big 80-20 treatment levers, right? So if you have a patient who has, for example, I'm going to give some kind of specifics here, but if you have a patient who has like a spleen chi deficiency type presentation, maybe they've got fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome and, you know, they're very tired and all this, and then you start kind of paying more attention to their intake and you also see signs of dampness, Right? And we also see that they're just inflamed. Maybe we don't need to go hard with the spleen tonics and the damp drainers and clear heat herbs and release exterior. Maybe we can find one of those categories that's like the big rocks in the jar that'll do most of the heavy lifting. So the general way to look at this is to go, okay, we need to clear excess before deficiency if we have mixed patterns, right? Now, already we're organizing our tools because we're already ranking things. All the 10,000 tools you got out on the table, if half of them are for clearing excess, then those are the half to pay more attention to. They're going to be more valuable. They're going to do more heavy lifting. The other half you could set aside and maybe use them later, right? All the tonics and supplement type therapies, right? Again, this isn't black and white, but it gives you a sense of like giving different weight to different therapies so they don't all have equal ranking. And that'll help you start to make decisions because you can start with some of the big bangers, right? You can start with some of these 80-20 like uh, formulas that are very widely used in China, uh, very safe, things like Shao Chai Hutong, right? The Shao Chai Hutong plus San Ren Tong combination, very cool. This is something that's come through from, from Jin Zhao and his work looking at dampness and how just how big that is. It's such a stick in the spokes. If you can get that out of somebody's system, everything else can start to sort itself out and you don't have to over-treat them in that case, right? So these kinds of things, uh, Huo Shang Zheng Qi Tong, right? If somebody's got like digestive issues, sometimes food stagnation is, is what you need to be looking at. Like there's a a patent called MicroGuard, MicroGuard Plus, right? Botanical biohackings put these out. These guys are really, they have their fingers on the pulse of elegant clinical simplicity type formulas. Just things that you can have in your pharmacy that do heavy, heavy lifting for you. And you don't have to have 10,000 things. And it's great. It's fantastic. And once we get that set up, of looking at all the tools and then organizing them and going, okay, you know, I can probably simplify this a lot. It does set us free a lot in our practice, but we're still going to have outliers. We're still going to have outlier cases. So <laughs> we go back and we get out all the tools out on the table, right? And we got everything. And what I'm proposing here is that we look at a progression of learning where initially we're overwhelmed with the 10,000 things. And then we start to refine and get down and distill. Okay, I can run a clinic with 12 formulas or whatever. And I'm maybe going to have, you know, 80% of the people that come through are going to have great success. And then I've got that other 20% of kind of outliers that I've got to work on and figure stuff out. Uh-oh, I thought I wanted things to be simple. Well, they can be, right? But then there's going to be other things you can use. Because sometimes people are deficient and they need um, futsa or something like that to get them going. You know, you, you want to have these other tool sets, but just know that you're, you're maybe not going to use them as much, but that doesn't mean none. So we move from this place of everything's on the table. We're entirely confused and overwhelmed and trying to make a diagnosis is just nuts because we see all these conflicting patterns. Plus we've got, you know, 10,000 tools to, okay, we're going to get rid of most things. We've got like 10 things on the table in terms of herb formulas or therapeutics or whatever. Simplify stuff, but it can also oversimplify, and then we lose fidelity on the cases because then we try to jam the people into our model as opposed to letting the model expand to match the reality of the people. And then we can dip into all those other tools that we took off the table, we can put them back on the table, and then we can look and go, okay, out of all these, what's the what's the 20% that's going to do 80% of the heavy lifting of what's left? <laughs> yeah. And what we're doing here is we're getting the fractal 80 20, meaning. You've got 20% of people that are outliers and aren't responsive to this kind of clinical simplicity approach. 
out of that 20%, 80% of them are going to respond to something. So figure out what that is. And then you're going to have another 20% of the 20%, right? And you can figure out what 80% of them are going to respond to. And you can kind of keep going with this. You can chase this outlier subset of the population. You can make it smaller and smaller and smaller, depending on how much work and effort you're willing to put into developing your own clinical treatment algorithms. So for example, one example is doing this kind of, okay, I'm going to clear wind. I'm going to clear damp. I'm going to clear these excesses first, but I've got people who are coming in and yes, they're damp, but they're also damp and very cold. And they've been sick for a long, long time, like Lyme disease or chronic fatigue syndrome, that kind of thing, mold exposure, and everything's basically shut down and they're in hibernation mode. So when I use something like Sha Chai Hu Tong, San Ren Tong, it makes sense to do those as heavy lifters but the person doesn't even have enough yang chi to activate, to release their own exterior. You give them shao chai hu and it's like, there's a little bit of uh, ren shen ginseng in there to like boost them up. There's that formula is really cool. Cause it's, it's actually like a fractal microcosm of all these things. It's got a little bit of tonification, right? But blended, but it's still not enough. It's like, you're trying to release their exterior and harmonize, but they don't have the yang chi. Everything's turned down. They're in hibernation mode. I found with those kinds of patients, even though they're the minority, but when I see them, I've evolved my clinical thinking. I, I can recognize that like, oh, you're one of those in hibernation mode. So that's when I'll start with a uh, Futsa formula, right? Something like that. Uh, Qian Yang Don, Heiner Fruhoff's uh, classical pearls line. He's got a very good uh, Qian Yang Don formula. Or you could look at other things, uh, anything with Futsa in it, basically. Something like that to warm them up. And I found it's really interesting because now you can you can dip into this just light up that that yang chi a little bit. And then all of a sudden, the Xiao Chai Hu, the San Ren Tong, all that has something to work with. And then the person starts clearing out that damp. And this is one of those things where, again, what, what I'm getting at is not just this specific example, like, hey, copy my protocol. It's more, I want to share with you how I'm thinking about this because we've I've identified the heavy lifters, right? This clearing damp heat idea, releasing the exterior, harmonizing. It's great. It's great. But there are people who don't respond to that. And when that happens, do we abandon simplicity and just go back for grasping and rifling through our 10,000 treatments options? Or do we have some kind of logic in place where we go, oh, okay, I see. We need to activate the yang chi first, and then we can go back to this and it'll work a lot better. It's this kind of thinking. This is the same thing, right? So this journey for practitioners, it's the same thing that happens in terms of rapport, right? So initially when we start we're contrasted with Western medicine and a lot of patients, not everybody, but the kind of the prevailing opinion is like, Oh, my Western MD uh, barely spends any time with me. Doesn't listen to me. I see the top of their head the whole time while they write a prescription and then they send me out the door. Right? So this is kind of the general idea the public has coming in. And then we want to be different than that. Right? So we block off an hour. I'll listen to everything you have to say. Right? And, and then sometimes we overcompensate so much that we pretend to be their therapist when we're not trained or qualified for that. It's like, oh, I want to make sure you know I'm different. So I'm going to listen, listen, listen. I'm listening so hard. Well, that's one stage of development. But then the next stage is to, instead of overcompensating and letting the pendulum swing so far, right, is to come back and say, okay, I can organize my clinical thinking to where it really doesn't take me that long to get the relevant information, so we're not going black and white, like, oh, your, your Western doctor doesn't listen to you. So I want to hear everything that ever happened in your life, right? It's not that. It's like, I want to listen and find out the information I actually need so that I can help you effectively. Now, that's just like the baseline. For me personally, I really enjoyed when I was in brick and mortar practice, having my clinical systems dialed in so that I could do an intake fairly quickly, get the information I need and understand the part of my brain that was making a plan and figuring out the logistics of what herbs and all that could be satisfied pretty quickly. Here's my diagnosis. Here's my treatment. And then instead of just like <laughs> kicking the person out at that point and bringing in the next person, I would s still save a few minutes so I could actually like get to know the human, right. And, and find out about their life and what things, you know, maybe we have, common interests or we know people, you know, there's all, all kinds of nice things to talk about and connect with the actual human there. So if you can get the business end done of diagnosis, figure out the treatment, prognosis, all that quickly, that gives you a little time to actually talk to the person. And this is not the same thing as pretending to be their therapist, right? It's actually just looking at the person there and just connecting with them and getting to know your community. 
I would say that's one of the strongest gifts actually of getting your shit together with clinical systems, like having the clinical clarity around what it is you're doing. It, it makes everything so much faster. And then your option is what do you do with the extra time that you're saving? Right? So yeah, you could pack in more patients, go see, you know, 20 patients an hour or whatever, cause it only takes you two or three minutes to come to a diagnosis or you could keep it at four an hour, five an hour, six an hour, something like that, and have a few minutes to just kind of shoot the breeze with people and find out what's going on in your community and stay connected that way. It's, it's a different, it's just different. So these are things to think about is this kind of progression of growth. And a lot of times it's like three stages. It's like, okay, well, we have Western medicine who doesn't listen to you and is too busy. And then you've got this overcompensating swing all the way to the other side where we'll just be here for an hour listening to everything and thinking we're holding space when really we're just an empty container, right? Just being talked at. And then there's this middle ground, right? And it's the same thing with putting all your 10,000 tools on the table. The first step is gathering them all up and then getting overwhelmed and trying to make everything super customized and super bespoke. And then the second step is to go to simplicity and say, okay, these are my 80-20 bell curve harmonizing heavy lifting formulas, right? And then that's an overcompensation as well. That's the other end of the the pendulum. And then there's a, a middle ground, a medium, a balanced point where you've built a foundation on these 80-20 big leverage formulas. You've got a foundation on clinical simplicity, right? And then you have the clinical clarity over top to start to navigate those outlier cases without getting overwhelmed so that you can deliver bespoke customized care that rests on a foundation of things that are pretty universal and help most people. It's really, really cool. So this is not to make generic, like, oh, everybody has to fit into my clinical simplicity or my, you know, whatever. It's, it's not that you want to let your model grow and evolve to help the actual people that are coming to you, the reality there. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we're back to the, you know, step one where everything's out on the table and we're just overwhelmed, right? It's a lot different when you have the map. So navigating that is, I think there are rites of passage there. And depending on where you are in that journey, you know, you're going to feel different ways probably about what I said, but that it's just the reality of it so far that I've seen is that we find a balance, right? We go from one extreme to the other and we will find a balance in our practice and our personal development and our professional development. And the more we can pursue that balance, the more people we can help with integrity. So I hope that helps you on your path. Thanks for staying up. We'll talk soon. Get to work.